talking about electronic transmissions today. And what we got here is we've got a uh, solenoid situation that we deal with on these transmissions. You know, years ago when we talked about these transmissions earlier, they had uh, fluid pressure that was, went up and down based on the movement of fluid through these passages in the valve body and pressure. They have different size lands and on the uh, spool valves and all that in the valve body. And if you had, like for instance, you got a situation where you got a bigger land here and a smaller land on the other side. You got pressure on the other side. The pressure on the bigger land will override that. And, uh, you guys top down over there. All right. But you got a, a solenoid. Uh, what it does in order to make the fluid pressure to change the fluid pressure as it flows through those passages, you got a solenoid and it's got a winding. We're gonna make it. spring-loaded ball sort of a thing, right? There's a, it's a, basically like this, it's got a spring around it. It's got a ball-shaped deal and there's a seat, all right? That seat actually is hooked into this thing where fluid pressure is going through here, right? There's fluid pressure on there. And if this seat happens to have this little porch stopped up, then it uh, lets that pressure go here. But if you don't want that pressure to be enough to move the valves in the valve body and do whatever they're going to do, you're going to raise this spring up. When you energize this, well, you're, you know, you got B plus coming in, and you got B minus, and when you put B minus on that, that solenoid is going to make an electromagnetic field that's going to move the core of that, and it's going to cause this uh, fluid to bleed off. Got that? <coughs> so your fluid bleeds off whenever that it solenoid is energized. Uh, that's typically the way that works. So this is the electronic pressure control? Yeah, this is actually electronic. Well, no, that's a different kind of a deal. Uh, so, I mean, this is... Uh, we're going to go. We're going to go question by question. But to start with, I got to lay some basic, some groundwork for you. All right. I got what you're saying. Because when it pulls out, that's when it leads off pressure. It does. Whatever. But what happens if you un what if you kill all the pressure to an automatic transmission? Like if I, I was to go out there on somebody's automatic transmission and I was to pull the fuse that was to make the automatic the, the transmission solenoids work. Uh, well, that's not exactly so. What you think you're going to fix it work when you blow a fuse, the car will move? Oh, I don't, I don't think so. You gonna put you in a bad part of town because you jerk the fuse out, put it out for your radio, and now you put it in. I don't know. It may take off in a higher gear. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That one girl that was in here that one time. You know, she remember I told you that she was saying my my transmission. You know, trying to take off in high gear. You know, she called me in and, and, and called me on the phone. I said, well, I took up look at the fuses. Then her dad said, this is the stupidest little thing I ever heard. Oh, look, the fuse is wrong. She found a blown fuse, put it in there. Ooh, she's in low gear. Huh? Huh? It's like you're supposed to be, you know, and all that. But, of course, that same car also had a, uh, you know, she called said, my car needs a starter. And I says, uh, a starter? She says, yeah, I'm not going to be able to put it on there the next week because I ain't got no money. I said, well, uh, I sent some of the guys over there with their pickup truck and a tow rope and they dragged the car over here, a little Pontiac and ran them. And uh, I says, okay, let's see about that. See if we can turn the motor. I couldn't turn it. Well, I saw Hunter Brown put the drive bar on there with an old muscled up arm trying to turn the motor and it slipped the belt on the air conditioner. And so I said, let's take the belt off. So we took the belt off and it fired up. <laughs> well, the air conditioner compressor clutch was locked up. I mean, the bearing. And so we found an old compressor laying in a pile of junk over there. We pulled, because it was the same as hers, pull that uh, over there and put it on her and fix the thing for free. <laughs> it cost her a thing. Well, she was a student here at the time. So you went out to the parts house and all that. Alicia was her name. She the one that, you know, punched on her brown when he told her she lost it. Oh, <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. All right, now then. So the PCM energizes the solenoid. The armature overcomes spring and fluid pressure, and it holds it, uh, and it blocks fluid pressure. So no fluid pressure can flow through the solenoid to the sump, you see. Um, if, it, you know, that's the solenoid. Over. So I basically energizes dumping the pressure out of this passage and de-energizes in there. Uh, so uh, it exhausts line pressure, you know, on, on that. Uh, and that's the, there's normally closed and normally open types though, and they work. The solenoid can work opposite the opposite of the one that I drew on the board behind me. So be, be particular about that. Right, I'm going to move that over there so we can see better. Now we're crooked. We got to get straight. Okay, that's good. All right. Now then, uh, the operation we got electronic pressure control solenoid. Now listen to how this one works. This is interesting. It's different. It's similar to this vaguely. But it is a, what we call a variable force type solenoid, and it has a solenoid and regulating valve in it. It's normally closed to exhaust, and it normally opens to EPC pressure. 
And so it provides uh, electronic pressure control that regulates line pressure by producing resisting forces to the main regulator valve. All right. and, and the line modulator valve, and that regulates line modulated pressure, controls clutch and band application pressures, and it can affect shift feel. That's the way that kind of thing works. So, like on that. Here's another little short story. This guy, uh, and we're talking about electronic transmissions here. Uh, this transmission mechanic that was working where I worked over there, worked. he pulled a, uh, he had a uh, F-150. It was like a 95 model or something like that. And so uh, the, the complaint was that it would shift uh, into its highest gear before it ever even hit 30 miles an hour. I mean, if, even if he got on it pretty good, it'd go, wah, wah, wah. He's in his highest gear right away. Now this is four wheel drive and it's you know like a three quarter ton deal and all that and it's really like it a, a utility bit on the back or something. But anyway, he he worked on that doggone thing and he got it uh, work work work. He pulled it apart, rebuilt it, and checked all the innards of that son of a gun and uh, put it back together just like it was, just like it was. He did work on it for a couple of days rebuilding it. So he puts it all back together and uh, of course they call for the calf rope and you know I don't have all the answers but they call me over there and I said went over and when I got in it and sat down I noticed that. Uh, the warning lights on the dashboard, you know, on the instrument cluster weren't working. And I said, uh, Kevin, did you notice the warning lights on the instrument cluster on this truck aren't working? Yeah, I don't care nothing about that. I'm just working on transmission. I said, well, now wait a minute. I says, one of the warning lights that's on the dashboard is the 4x4 four four low light. Okay, so the PCM is actually watching that. Here's your, coming from your battery, you got a light bulb, B plus, and it's going through a fuse that feeds all the other warning lights. See, I get this feeds all the warning lights and those little bulbs over here. But this one right here is actually going to the switch in the transfer case, right? The transfer case switch grounds that and turns that on when you put it in 4 by 4 low. Is that complicated? You understand where you understand what we're going here, okay? All right. The PCM is watching this. As long as it sees 12 volts there, everything's normal. But it uses that input. If you ground this, and this bulb illuminates, what happens to that 12 volts? It goes away. When it goes away, the PCM is programmed on that trunk to think you're in 4x4 low, and if you're in 4x4 low, when do you need to hit, get, hit your highest gear? About 30 miles an hour. And if you're in 4x4 low, it's a real low skill. You transfer uh, case planetaries, you kick in, and you're so like a truck. So that transmission for nothing. He did. But the fact is, he had zero volts here. Why did he have zero volts here? Because his fuse was blown. <laughs> you were on one of that? The fuse was blown. And what he could have done as soon as that thing came in here, if he wanted to be a brilliant transmission mechanic, he'd never seen this before, wasn't even thinking about it. You see, you, you think clearly. I always found it's a whole lot better to think about something a little bit before you start twisting bolts. You know, but he hadn't really been in that business so long. He's pretty good at rebuilding transmission, but he just jerked that sucker out through seals and clutch it because that's what he knew how to do. And that's what people do a lot of the time. So they know how to replace some parts rather than finding out what's wrong. They just do what they know how to do, and they start throwing parts at it. Now, that starts to hurt whenever the parts are $75, $100, $200 a pop, and it's just like it was when you're done. See? But, uh, but anyway, uh, but that was a that was a sort of a, he was perishing for lack of knowledge there is what it meant to. Always remember that. If you see one that's shifting into its highest gears, real quick, <coughs> make darn sure that it doesn't think it's in four-wheel load. Because it's all zero volts, it thought it was in four-wheel load. Now that's the end of that story. All right, variable force. One of the things that happens, what happens, what's going to happen if you uh, if it's fail shorted on these, uh, these are, this is basically on a forward transmission. If it fails shorted, you won't have any EPC pressure at all. You won't have any third or fifth gear, and it's going to slip in second and fourth with high input torque. Right? And in other words, if you're pulling hard, it's going to slip in second and fourth. And uh, alternate, it'll, it'll alternate engine firing to limit torque on some platforms. If it fails open, you got maximum EPC pressure. You're going to have harsh shifts and engagements, and it may set a false VSS code. Boom! It's going to hit hard. Oh, you got that? So, the electronic pressure control solenoid does what? What's the answer to that question? We just talked about it. Were some of you guys tuning me out because you're bored or what? What's up with that? Okay. 
I don't want you to write down on that paper if it is a current control. The more current you give it, the more it moves. It can regulate pressure. It is not on or off only. The more current you apply, the more it changes the pressure, right? Okay, so if, uh, if, you, if you apply maximum, if it's shorted to the point to where it's going to wind up holding the, you know, doing, uh, in other words, if it's on all 100% of the time, you're going to have low pressure and these other symptoms. Now, it regulates line pressure by producing resisting forces to the main regulator valve, and it controls clutch and band application pressure. But remember, if it fails shorted, you won't have any third or fifth gear, slips in second and fourth, you know, the forward transmissions that, uh, like you're going to see, like the E4 or the and those extra All right. You got that? All right. One more time. All right. Current control solenoid. It's a, it's a current control solenoid. All right. All right. The way, if you're going to look at the way this thing's put together, let's draw this one sideways. All right, you got windings. I'm going to draw the windings like that always. That's it. That's, it's got your, you know, you got wire wrapped around and around it. And right. Kind of like this right here. See that right there? You're going to have winding wrapped around inside here. And it's going to move a core. And basically what you got is you got fluid pressure. Like that. Coming out of that thing like that. And then whenever you look at the, and I'm looking at a little illustration here, it's got a little pintle up there in here. Like that, that rides against there. And um, whenever you get your, uh, uh, there's a spring down in here. You know. And then you got another spring back up in here. Uh, but the more current that it applies to these windings, the more it's going to move that. And see how this thing right here is, uh, is stepped and it's basically got another step right here and the passage is made in such a way so that it can, it can actually act like a metering rod. How many people have a metering rod and a carburetor? How many of you guys are carburetor buffs? You know what a metering rod and a carburetor does? A metering rod and a carburetor, and this thing is going to work like that, except it's going to... Now, the metering rod and a carburetor, imagine a port <coughs> right here with a stepped metering rod. Like that. Now, if you're having to depend on fuel to flow through there, and you can shove that meter and rod down in there, the Stop bigger these fuel. steps get, the less fuel, fuel, fuel is going to go through there, right? So this all the way down, you got the least amount of fuel. You think of it like that, except you basically are going to be able to move it real smoothly up and down, see? And that's what that is about. All right, so anyway. So... Uh, let's see. The PCM controls all this. Okay, now let's look at your transmission fluid temperature uh, sensor signal. What does a PCM use that for? Transmission fluid temperature signal. And don't say to determine transmission fluid temperature. That's a bad answer. Okay, is that what you were thinking? Don't go there. Transmission fluid temperature sensor. You got that? What are you, where is it? What can you tell me about that? Transmission fluid temperature sensor. What about uh, if the fluid is too cold, it's not going to operate the torque converter clutch. Right? So what happens when the torque converter clutch locks in? Huh? It's not shear in fluid. When the torque converter clutch is locked in, it's not shear in fluid, is it? When it's not shear in fluid, it's not making heat. So if you're not made, if everything's nice and cold, you kind of want that fluid to heat up and get to its regular temperature, so you're going to let it shear fluid all the way. <coughs> in other words, if your engine coolant temperature is below a certain temperature, it won't lock the torque converter clutch in. And that's basically like that. So if you've got one, a lot of people get where they notice that the torque converter clutch ain't going in because they got more RPM than they used to have. So whenever you're going up through your gears, you got first, second, third, fourth, right? Fourth is overdrive, right? Okay, now you can turn off overdrive, can't you? But your torque converter clutch is going to be energized when you're in third gear. So the torque converter clutch, clutch locks in in third, and you got a straight lockup from the engine all the way to the wheels, and then you go into overdrive. And then not only do you got a straight lockup all the way to the wheels, but you're also turning the drive shaft faster than you're turning the engine. It's giving you some really dynamite gas mileage. All right. You know what kind of gas mileage these Crown Victorias that we got out here get on the highway? Not some miles. Like what do you miles, think? About 28 miles a gallon. 28 miles a gallon. Believe a Crown Victoria would get that? Yeah. yeah. I've driven these suckers on trips and, and done the gas mileage. That old 98 model has got 250,000 miles on it or whatever. It gets like 26. 
But that's because of, I mean, on a long trip on an interstate, you're going to get dynamite gas mileage on a car that big. On a doggone Buick, um, like an old 90, I mean, 89 or 91 Buick uh, with a 3.1 in it or whatever, uh, you'll get 30 out of one of them, 31, 32. My Taurus, my 95 Ford Taurus, if it was on a cold day because of lock-up torque converter and all that, that Taurus was just a plain old 3 liter, a lot like this Sable out here, except it was one year older. That'd get 33 miles to the gallon. Yeah. It would. I mean, uh, but uh, my wife had a 2001 Taurus. It would get 33 miles to the gallon. We'd clock it on trips. You know, and uh, so... But nowadays, when they got a silly little smart car that looks like a beer can, they think they're busting the walls out of for getting 32 miles in a gallon. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're, they're cooking the books on the can. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, of course, you know, we got to, you know, worry. we got to make sure that we are good stewards of our environment, so we're not going to, I'm not, like, concerned about going green, but we don't need to waste gas either. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, <clears throat> we're already going green with our cars breathing out carbon dioxide because the trees like carbon dioxide. We talked about that before. Like if, the, if the trees in the grass could hear us talking about cutting off some of their air supply, they'd get us by the throat. I'm serious, they would. If the trees in the trees in the grass, like, wait a minute, you're talking about cutting off my air, man. If you're doing away with carbon dioxide, I mean, the, the people are acting like, oh, carbon footprint's heating up the world and all that, but the grass and the trees like it because they lay low to the ground anyway because the atomic waste greater than oxygen and nitrogen, so it's going to lay low. Anyway, that's it. I get in trouble with the environment as most here, and somebody even batted me out. All right, so. All right, let's go on. <clears throat> See, transmission fluid temperature is going to use to uh, electronic pressure control strategy. It's obviously got to be different if the fluid is at a different weight, I mean a different viscosity. <coughs> the hotter it gets, the thinner it gets. You so notice how motor oil and transmission fluid gets as thin as gasoline when it gets really good and hot? So it, it determines when to... The electronic pressure control strategy is going to be different at different transmission fluid pressure. Oh, okay. At the temperature. Now, the PCM sends a reference voltage signal to the transmission fluid temperature sensor and it determines the temperature of the transmission by the amount of voltage received on the signal return. It is a positive temperature coefficient sensor, just like your engine coolant temperature sensor, just like your intake air temperature sensor. The lower the resistance goes, you know, the, the colder it is, the lower resistance is. In other words, your pressure control solenoid is going to have a different strategy, a different, there's going to be a different amount of current applied to it, and it's going to have the uh, the PCM is going to have to factor in the temperature uh, whenever it's in there. <coughs> torque converter application strategy is another thing, so it's not going to apply the torque converter. Um, pressure that, uh, it's not going to apply the torque converter whenever it's cold. But the pressure, the EPC, uh, it, the answer if you're going to put that down is uh, EPC control strategy and torque converter clutch application strategy. That's what basically the answer we're looking for here. Okay. All right, you got that? Everybody ready with that? All right, now then, let's go to, if there's no signal in the EPC circuit, or the PCM has no control over the signal, the EPC solenoid is designed to do what? What's it designed to do? A default to maximum line pressure. I'll tell you something else, too. If there's a problem where it thinks the transmission is slipping, it's going to jack the pressure, it's going to, Cause that EPC solenoid to raise the pressure all the way up, it's going to make it shift hard, and it's going to blink the overdrive light. Usually. Now, some of these cars have got a little gear with an exclamation point in the middle of it for a transmission light and all that. But if you see a blinking light on your, uh, you know, your torque converter, you know, your overdrive lights blinking, that's the only thing way you can talk to you on some of them. Uh, and a lot of some of these trucks now have got transmission temperature gauges on them. Now, remember what I told you about when you're sitting in traffic somewhere like in St. Louis, Missouri, in the hot summertime and uh, you're trying to get somewhere, and your <coughs> traffic's lined up as far as you can see, and you're sitting here and drive. That torque converter's going to share fluid. If you just sit there and drive without going, it's going to eat the transmission up, and it's going to start boiling the fluid, and it's going to puke it out in the vent. You're going to have fluid running out of the front of the car. Throw it in park. Oh, you can let to keep a motor running, but this will in park. You know, don't, don't let it sit here and drive. What's the point in that? I, I put mine in park when it's in the drive through You know, if I'm having to sit there a while, you don't have drives, so you'd be slow enough. All right. All right, so number four, the PCM uses vehicle speed sensor and output shaft sensor and turbine speed sensor information. What does it need this stuff for? Uh, well, no, not really. Uh, they're all used to calculate shift, shift scheduling, scheduling, torque converter, clutch operation, and EPC pressure. But think about this. You're going to see a code every now and then when you're working on an electronic automatic transmission, and it's going to say, wrong gear ratio obtained for third gear. Because it knows, all right, how do you know when you get the wrong ratio? If you're, uh, let's say that you're, uh, you take off and you're watching your transmission, your, your tack, and it's going to go, mm-hmm, 
remember how it does that? Yeah. But your mind is going to tell you something's wrong if it goes, ah, ah. Now, the PCM knows that it told it to shift into third. It also knows that it didn't. Or if it jumps over third and goes right to fourth, the PCM is going to know that too. You got that? So, so it, it watches the input and output shaft sensors. It knows how fast the engine's turning. It knows how fast the turbine shaft is turning. It knows how fast the vehicle's going. It knows all this stuff. And it can do the math really fast. It can do what you can do because you can basically tell. How do you know if your torque converter clutch is slipping? Let's say it's at 100% and you, got, and you suspect that it's slipping. Watch your tachometer. Watch your speed. Crowd the throttle just a little bit when the torque converter locks up at 45 or 50 or wherever it locks up. And when you crowd the throttle a little bit, and if your uh, engine speed starts gaining on your vehicle speed, you know the torque converter is slipping. Or you got a slippage somewhere when your, and your clutch is in there. You know like it is on your, on your doggone standard transmission. If you got a slipping clutch, you know that son of a gun ought to be going up at the same rate of speed at the, at the speedometer. But if the tachometer is going, ah, you know, when you're doing that, that's bad news. That's bad news. All right. So, uh, so it uses a vehicle speed sensor, output shaft sensor, and turbine speed sensor. Uh, to what? Uh, calculate shift scheduling, torque converter clutch operation, and EPC pressure. In order for any computer to do stuff, uh, it's going to have to have input. Before it can give you good output, it's got to have input. What's the last one? And uh, EPC pressure. It's a closed loop system. How many of you guys know the difference between a closed loop system and an open loop system? I don't understand it. I know what you're talking about, but I don't understand it. It's the easiest thing in the world to understand. See this wristwatch right here? Mm -hmm. It's complicated, but it doesn't know if it's right or wrong. It doesn't reset itself. If it was an atomic watch that was talking with that radio signal to that uh, place up there, uh, wherever the standard, you know where the clock is, the national clock, you know, like these clocks, these sky scan clocks, that's a closed loop clock. If the time is not right, it can reset, it'll reset itself to where it's right. Oh, so closed loop means well, it's, it's like got an it's input that it can tell if it's doing what it's supposed to. It's or like not. That, uh, oh, yeah. right. the air conditioner yeah. thermostat. Yeah. You remember me talking about that before? You set that thermostat at 65. If it don't see 65, it's going to kick on the air. When it gets to 65, it's going to turn off the air. That's closed loop. It's checking. And it's going to make a change if it can. Now, that's what this is. You've got a closed-loop system in this PCM. And this PCM is going to do stuff, and then it's going to watch some inputs to see if what it's telling it to do. Now, you're going to see occasionally these codes that will say, 3-4 shift solenoid performance fault. You know what that means? If you see that code, if you see that code in your computer, it means I don't see an electrical problem with this. But I do see that I told this solenoid to operate, and what was supposed to happen didn't happen. So I'm watching the output, I mean, I'm watching the inputs that's telling me about what's going on while I send my outputs to make things happen. Here's how you do this if I come over here and I try to turn off this light, and the light stays on, I'm going to jack around with the switch and flip it a few more times to see if I can get it to work right, right? You see what I'm saying? The, my feedback is my eyeballs. I can tell if a light went off or not. That's a closed loop. Yeah. You'd be surprised how much of a closed loop system everything's working. I mean, and that's what engineers had to start doing on these cars is they had to make sure. And your oxygen sensor. The PCM changes the air-fuel mixture constantly, and the oxygen sensor is giving it feedback. See, and it's actually responding to that feedback all the time. When it starts ignoring the oxygen sensor, that's an open loop situation. Wide open throttle, cold engine, this kind of stuff. See? All right. Now then. Hey, what have I heard anything about oxygen since it gets wet? Not really, unless it's got any freeze. You know the, the uh, well. I will tell you this: it will hurt it if it's hot and not, and water drips on it. It'll usually crack the ceramic zirconia, and then it's toast. I'm talking about if it's just laying in the water. Yeah, if it's laying in the water, it usually won't hurt it. You know, I mean, but if it's like I say, if it's if you're driving down the road and your air conditioner condensate's dripping on it while it's in your pipe, you know, you're gonna butt you'll mess it up. But if you just get it, you know, if you just get, unless you dip it in the antifreeze, and antifreeze got silicone in it, it's going to stop up the little pores in that ceramic zirconia, it's not going to work anymore. So if you do a head gasket job on a car, you may as well sell them a couple oxygen sensors too, right to start with. So they don't come back and say, hey, it wasn't like that before. Okay. Now then, let me move on down to the next question here. Because, uh, you, I mean, you guys are, I don't want you guys checking out on me, okay? All right, right here. Uh, if the PCM detects, and this is these Ford cars now. If the, trans the transmission has been shifted into reverse when the vehicle's traveling in the forward position, what does it do? 
That sounds scary, don't it? We're going to throw that thing in reverse going down the road? The PCM turns on shift solenoid one to move the one two shift valve in order to block the reverse hydraulic circuit and exhaust pressure so the transmission won't go into reverse. It prevents it from going into reverse. Write this down. It turns on shift solenoid one to move the one two shift valve in order to block the reverse hydraulic circuit and exhaust pressure so the transmission won't shift into reverse. It's smart enough to know you're going forward. Now, uh, the 95 Taurus I was talking about earlier, one of the things that spooked me about that darn thing was, uh, uh, you know, I talked about this, I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Uh, going down the interstate, you ever took the wrong exit and realized after you were part way on that ramp that you were on the wrong exit? And that just really bothers you because you may drive 20 miles before you turn around and come back. And I, I was over on Interstate 95, and there wasn't a whole lot of traffic out there, but I hit the wrong exit for some reason. I said, oh, I'm not going there. I pulled over, and I backed up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go that far. I was over probably 100, 250 feet, you know, up the ramp. I said, I'm going to back up onto the shoulder, and I'm going to get back on the interstate going the right way. Yeah. You know, probably a cop would probably lock me up for that. But you know, I threw that thing in reverse, and I'm going to back up pretty fast. And it felt like the fuel pressure was bad, or it was not running right. Mm -hmm. And I said, what's the matter with my car here? Well, I don't know. I'll put it back and drive it. It's fine. And I found out later that that 95 Taurus, because of the response to all of the problems people had with cars running away in reverse, actually was set up so that it wouldn't go past beyond a certain speed in reverse. Yeah, it's kind of like a bread limit. Yeah, and it, it, yeah, it did crazy things. It felt weird. I thought, well, I, mean, I, thought, you know, I got good so trouble out here on Interstate 95, you know. But, uh, it, but it, going forward, it did fine. Well, I told Eddie Spann had one like this. Brown Sable. I said, let me show you this, Eddie. So me and him got a big old empty parking lot one time we was on his car. And he, I said, let's see if this car does that, because it was a year newer, or well, it was a 98 model. And he threw that thing in reverse, and he must have gotten 70 miles an hour in reverse, and never did. <laughs> so I guess they didn't type that into the later ones, but they did in that 95. I don't know why they didn't keep that. So if you just expected it, and it wasn't there, I mean, I don't guess they ever thought about that very much. Nervous. All right, so hold on now. It moves the one-two shift valve. It moves the one-two shift valve in order to block the reverse hydraulic circuit. And it exhausts pressure so the transmission won't shift in reverse. It will not let it go in reverse. Uh, and that, you know, those well, engine, the, those, the, not, what uh, it exhausts pressure so the transmission, reverse hydraulic circuit. In other words, uh, and it won't let it go in, it won't let it, it will not let it hold that planetary carrier and put it in reverse. Is mine the same way? Yours, I wouldn't trust that. I mean, it might be, but I don't know how it is on that Corvette, but I would say that anybody that's typing, uh, uh, program control instructions for automatic transmission controller would be wise to do that so that if it accidentally got knocked into reverse, it wouldn't uh, tear it up. My mother uh, was driving our 66, 66 Chrysler New Yorker one time, and my little sister knocked it in reverse, you know, just somehow flopped around her foot, hit the, you know, before anybody was wearing seat belts much. But anyway, flipped it around and knocked it in reverse, it just all the engine going down the road, you know. But, um, but anyway, uh, that's just the little thing. All right, now then, let's look. Uh, let's move on down here. How can a faulty engine coolant temperature sensor affect transmission shift strategy? It's going to uh, command it to operate on a cold shift schedule, and it causes the transmission to shift different. So you got to pay attention to everything on your PID data when you're going into that data stream. You look at everything and you think. Now I've told you guys a bunch of times the smartest thing you can do is plug into as many cars as you can and look at that stand tool data stream and get used to what it looks like. If you get used to what it's supposed to look like on all these cars, you'll get to where you can pick out a problem real quick. You yeah, know, the treasury it people. On a yeah, it's a cold shift schedule. And it causes it to shift different. It's not going to shift the same. Number seven, we got this question and three more to go. What does a PCM use electronic ignition system data for? PPC pressure control, shift scheduling, torque converter apply and release control, and wide open throttle shift control. Every bit of that stuff. It pays attention to the engine speed for that. It's basically looking at how fast the engine's turning, right? And I think it factors in throttle angle and other things too, but one of the inputs it uses uh, for that is your, uh, your electronic ignition system. Wide open throttle. Wide open throttle, torque converter apply and release, Electronic pressure control shift scheduling, all that. Got that? Okay, number eight. How does operating a four wheel drive vehicle and four by four load affect the PCM's command of the transmission? I told you about that earlier. Yeah, it modifies the shift schedule for lower gear ratios. 
because it knows you got lower gear ratios. Two more questions, and then we're home free. Uh, how does air conditioner clutch operation affect the PCM's control of the transmission? Whoa, listen to that. Would you expect that? Would you even think the air conditioner would make any difference on transmission stuff? Yes, because I mean, it doesn't on a five-speed too. Yeah. Uh, in response to AC clutch operation, the PCM adjusts EPC pressure for the additional load on the engine. Got that? EPC pressure. All right. <coughs> It actually adjusts EPC pressure for additional load on the engine. Adjust torque converter clutch modulation and shift schedule. It's going to try to keep it from surging on you. Now, you remember what I told you about those that sound like you're going over the little speed breakers? Uh, you know, the little uh, strips of asphalt they put in the road that are really pretty and little ripples. And when you're going up to a stop sign, they want you to wake up so you go boom. Yeah, I was scratching my CDs when I was Yeah. Little, little. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact is... Uh, if you feel the one doing that when there's not any of those on the road, it's probably because the torque converter clutch is chattering. And typically when you, re when you use the right kind of fluid to reserve as the transmission, that probably won't go away. I had one one time that the torque converter clutch was acting crazy. And you know what the problem was it with? There was water in the transmission. You know where the water came from? When somebody put the dipstick back in there, they just kind of shoved it back in there, and they didn't shove it in there right, and they had it laying up against the suction line from the air conditioner, and condensate from the suction line was trickling down the dipstick into the transmission, and it got a bunch of water in the transmission. And the car came in there for a transmission torque converter shift issue, because that was where the first place that they noticed it. And I mean, but see, the thing about it is, knowing where that water came from, I was paying attention when I saw that that thing was kind of wasn't all the way in and was trapped under the suction line. And I saw that it was a little bit rusty. Water, water had been trickling down in there. When I observed it was a transmission, there was a bunch of water come out of it. Anyway, it wasn't a kiss of it. No, just put, I just serviced it. You know, put it back together. You don't, you don't rebuild it unless you have to. Hey, there, Archie. That's why Archie's just throwing a reaction sun shell. By the way, they charge us ninety dollars for that reaction sun shell. But we shall not surely die. I also got you a gasket set over there. So, I mean, every gasket that's available that you need for that transmission will be in that bag, and it wasn't 45 bucks for the whole gasket. Uh -huh. So you're okay with that. You're going to have that thing out of here today, won't you? <laughs> you going to be driving it? He's got all that together, just about. He's already put it back together. He put his stuff Archie. On. Yeah, Archie stayed on it, didn't he, Archie? Yeah. Um, yeah. His buddy is going to be really happy with him whenever that thing well, drives. No, I own that. He sold him the truck. Like a week before it went out. Did you, did you, sell, did you sell him that truck? <laughs> yeah. My goodness! You and sell him the truck? Out, and, well, like, I sold a guy a car one time, and he washed the paint off of it. Yeah. Well, I didn't paint the car. All right, so that's just, that's that's shameful. Well, I can understand why you're <coughs> bending over backwards trying to make you happy. Yeah. Uh, number 10. What is the difference? What's the difference between a digital transmission range sensor and an analog transmission range sensor? Whoa. Okay. Here we go. We're gonna have to draw a picture now. Okay. The what do we have? You know how throttle position sensor works, right? Mm -hmm. You got signal. You got V ref. You got signal return, which is a glorified ground. It goes back to the computer. It's good, clean ground. And all of these come out of the PCM, right? All right, as I just imagine this thing, instead of being a throttle position sensor, let's say that it is a transmission range sensor. Park, reverse, neutral, drive low. Oh, okay. See where I'm going with that? That signal is going to, and if you actually look at that signal on a scope, listen to this. You go click, 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 click. You hook your scope up to this signal wire. Once you go to your breakout box, hook your scope up. And that signal on your scope, it's going to look like this. <laughs> and if you see any ugly little dropouts or something like that, then you need to replace that transmission range sensor. Make sure you get it adjusted right and all that kind of thing. Now, digital transmission range sensor is a different creature. Uh, and some of the scan tools didn't have that factored in. It would just be all fouled up in what they display on that. Uh, some of you guys that's already, who's, who has not done the worksheet on the digital transmission range sensor? You've done it, haven't you? I don't think. Yeah. Um, I think I might have. All right. that? Digital transmission range sensor where you got a battery code. You got four pins. Oh, yeah, we did. We, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. That's what we need to do. And you got this ground actually going to another pin on PCM. And it hooks up like that. All right. And you got a set of switches here that all move together. Gang switches. <coughs> different ones of them are closed and open as you go through your different gear ratios. And so you're going to have. 
one of your, each one of those, whenever it's closed, that's a one. When it's open, that's a zero. So you're going to have, you know, different uh, strips, I mean, uh, battery code numbers look like a, look like zero, zero, one, and there'll be one, 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 zero, and stuff like that as these different switches close and open. And it's programmed to know by looking at these battery code what gear ratio it's in. I mean, what actually not gear ratio, but what gear selector position it's in. And so that's why I got a sheet on that where you measure all those voltages and you write them down and you do the math. And if you do the math right, you'll see a number here, like the way this battery math thing works on these four uh, digits, it's one, two, four, eight, right? Okay, so you could start it with zero. I'm just doing this to make it simple. Uh, let's say that uh, you had a one, 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 zero. The value of that, if you had two, four, six, and eight, that's 14, right? Okay, if it's one zero one zero, it's eight and two. That's ten in it. So each one, each position has got a different value as far as that kind of goes. So computers add and subtract. That's what they do. That's how they work. You know. And so. But anyway, that's what the difference is. You want to come down there and 